Good afternoon everyone. My name is Rob Austin Goodall. I'm going to be uh, moderating this webinar uh, entitled Virtual Meetings That Get Everyone Talking. Thank you so much for attending today. And for those who have um, been utilising the chat box, thank you very much for introducing yourself, putting the information, putting your thoughts on the question on screen uh, and saying where you're from. For those who have just joined who haven't used the chat box, um, there is a um, orange coloured chat now button in the bottom right hand corner. If you click on that, that should bring up the chat box. Um, if you have any questions as we move through this presentation, please put them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, hopefully what we'll try and do is group a number together that have a similar theme in that way. Um, again, thank you for all attending. Um, what we'll do now is we'll Click off, a click through the presentation. Um, the presentation is going to be delivered by my colleague Liz Bennett. Um, as I say, I'm Rob Austin Goodall and I'll be moderating. And I'll now hand over to Liz. We've got a lot to get through in the next hour. So over to you, Liz. Hi, Rob. Thank you. Thanks for that. And, uh, and hi to everyone. And, and also a warm welcome from me to this webinar on virtual meetings that get everyone talking. Um, of course, Virtual meetings have been the norm for many of us for a while, but now, of course, it's the norm for just about all of us. And linking back to Lisa Sue and the words that you saw on the very first slide, I think her words seem particularly relevant as, as right now this, this virtual world is, well, I guess it's making us all think about our relationships and how we connect with one another. It's making us think about um, our families and how we connect with them if we can't see them. It's making us think about our normal business, whatever your normal is, our normal business. And it's making us think about our meetings and it's making us think about all of those in a way that is different than we have thought about them before. And as Lisa Sue said, the virtual world gives us this opportunity to think about things differently. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm hoping that I'm going to get you thinking differently about virtual meetings. And to do that, I'm going to um, talk through what you need to do before the meeting in terms of your planning for the meeting, how to design the virtual meeting that you want in a way to ensure that everyone does communicate. I'm gonna talk through what you need to do during the meeting, how you facilitate it, um, how you make the meeting go in the way that you planned it to go, how you yourself communicate and role model what you want from others. And I'm also gonna talk, I'm talking quite a lot about your responsibilities if you're setting the meeting up, um, if you're the leader of the meeting, if you like. But I'm also going to talk about those many meetings that you go to where you are a participant. It's not your responsibility to lead the meeting. What is your role then as an active participant? And very importantly, I'm also going to talk about when the meeting's done <laughs> and you've breathed a sigh of relief, what do you need to do afterwards? evaluating it, learning, improving, etc. for the next time. Now, as I said, my name is Liz. I'm head of consultancy here at the IMECI, and I've worked in the virtual world for, for quite a long time now. Um, I'm doing it exclusively at the moment, of course, but I'm hoping that I can share with you some of the experiences that I've had and how in running meetings and in training virtually, we've managed to be able to get people talking to each other and to us. So that's what we're going to do today. So let's make a start. And the things that you need to do before the meeting, well, your meeting needs to start with your objectives. Now, we always say this about meetings, don't we? We always say you've got to plan your meeting, whatever it might be. And we equally know, don't we, that we don't always do it. But I guess the first point I'm going to land with you is it really is vital. If you want to have good virtual meetings, it's vital that you do sit down and take the time to think, what are my objectives? What is it that I want to achieve? 
And generally speaking, they'll fall into a couple of categories. It is when you're in a virtual meeting, it could be that your objective is to give people information. It tends to be more one way. It's you providing information through a presentation or a business update or whatever it might be. Or you could want a virtual meeting where you want discussion with people. You want their input, their feedback to you and to each other. You want their thoughts. And it could also be that in your virtual meeting, you want people to interact. You actually want the meeting to help you build relationships um, with your colleagues and with the team. And depending on which one of those is your main objective, is it one way, is it two ways, is it multi ways, depending on that, knowing that will help you decide how you're going to get it. So the very first thing is you must sit down and think, what is it I want to achieve in this meeting? And of course, maybe it's all of the things that I have just mentioned there. Maybe it's information, discussion and building relationships but you've got to take that step first because it'll help you decide how you're going to get it. And the how you're going to get it is, um, is starting with your objectives. How am I going to get it? What is the purpose of this meeting? What do you want them to achieve? What's their with them for attending? What's in it for them to attend this meeting? Generally speaking, as I've said, if it's information, then um, it's going to be one way. If it's interaction, it's going to be two ways. If it's collaboration, it's going to be several ways. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> okay. Whatever your meeting is, whether it is you giving information in the planning stage, you are going to decide that you want engagement with people. And engagement simply means you want them to want to be there. Engagement is both interaction and collaboration. So interaction is communication between you and your meeting attendees, your participants. It's really helpful, of course, because it keeps things moving. It keeps people interested and paying attention. Collaboration is one step further. Collaboration is actually getting people to work with each other and with you and helps ensure a deeper involvement. It's really about working together in the virtual world. So depending on what your objective is, it's going to help you decide, am I going to engage them and is interaction sufficient? Or am I going to engage them through collaboration? You can have either or you can have both. But it really does depend on what your objectives are and what you want to achieve from that meeting. So these are the tools, the very first tools. And in the planning stage, you really need to think, which tools am I going to use? Which techniques am I going to use, depending on what my objective is? So let's have a look at some of the tools that will help you get people talking in meetings. And the first ones I'm going to think about are the, um, the tools for interaction to get people to interact with you. They maintain interest. They may maintain attention. They add to this group feel. They will help you to get people talking to one another. And, you know, even if it's only mainly one way, if you're making a presentation, when you're planning your virtual meeting, just as you would spend time putting your slides together, you wouldn't dream of going into a meeting unless you had spent time on your slide deck. You also need to spend time deciding when you're going to use some or maybe even all of the tools that are listed on the slide there. Whiteboards, for example, when you put blank slides into your slide deck and you can just a blank slide into your slide deck, that becomes a whiteboard. Think in a face to face meeting, the number of meetings you've been to where perhaps you've had a flip chart or a whiteboard on the wall. A blank slide in your slide deck has exactly the same effect. 
you can make notes on it. You can get people writing on it. You can ask the people's comments or their thoughts. You can put a question on and get them to respond. It's the equivalent of getting them to talk to you, even though they're not using their voice. Polls. Polls are a great way for you to um, to get people's opinions in the meeting. For example, you might have, you know, you'll have an agenda. It, um, after each agenda item has been discussed, you could have a quick poll. Um, or even halfway through the meeting, you can have a quick poll just to check people's understanding or get their views on something. Yes, you're going to have to pre-prepare before the meeting starts what questions you want to ask them. But again, it's another interactive tool that you can drop into your meeting to get people talking to you. Web browsing, really, really useful um, technique to get people interacting. Instead of just looking at your slides, you could in the chat box drop a link for them to go to an internet page, or you could take everybody onto an internet page. It breaks it up. It's not just um, you doing the talking. It gets people interacting with you and helps you get their comments on things. Arguably the most common any virtual meeting that you've been into, I would, I, I would if I were a betting person, I'd put a bet on chat and emoticons are the ones that are most often used by people. And that's great. Nothing at all wrong with that. But remember, there is much more you can do with the chat box and with the emoticons than I normally see in virtual meetings. And uh, the slide is, is indicating to you, it's just a reminder that as far as emoticons are concerned, of course, there's much more than the smiley face. And using these emoticons really gives you an opportunity to read people's body language, as, this, as the heading on the slide says. You know, you can ask people how they're feeling. Um, you know, have they learned something? Uh, you can ask people, um, uh, you know, to click on the green tick if they agree, the red cross if they don't agree. You could use the coffee cup icon if somebody needs to step away from the meeting for a moment. I'll come back to that shortly. But really use these emoticons as well as the chat box to get people talking to you just so that you can check if they're still with you. You wouldn't dream of being in a face-to-face -face meeting and not looking for body language. And these emoticons in the chat are your equivalent uh, 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 method of doing that when you're in a virtual meeting. Now, during your meeting, of course, you can use these emoticons on the hoof, if I may use that phrase. You know, you can, um, you can ask people at any time, give me a smiley face if you agree with that. But the point that I'm making here, and I'm still talking about before the meeting starts when you're planning it, plan your meeting to know when you're going to ask people to do this. Because, as I'll show you on a later slide, I would recommend that in a virtual meeting to get people talking, you're asking them to do something every few minutes. So in your planning, say in your notes for the meeting, I'll ask people to click on the green tick or the red cross or whatever it may be. It helps you as well not to forget to do it. If you get so wrapped up in your own presentation, you may forget to ask them for their interactivity. So um, before we move on to looking at some of the collaboration techniques, let me just have another quick word with you, if I may, about whiteboard. <clears throat> now, I said a moment ago, you can have a blank slide, drop it into your slide deck, and then um, ask people to type on it. It's more than just a text tool. For example, I, and I know different platforms, and I don't know which platforms are your main usage, of course, but different platforms have slightly different tools, but they also have a lot of common tools, a lot of similarities. Most of them have a pointer. If you ask people to click on a pointer, 
if you haven't already done this, their name comes up on the pointer so you can see who's made which comment and then you can draw them in. You can say, oh, Liz, I see, you know, you said, did I tell me more about that? So get them to use the pointer as well as just typing onto the whiteboard. Get them drawing, get them using different colors, get them interacting with you because all the time they're doing that, you are increasing your chances of having engaged with them and you're getting them talking to you. So collaboration techniques. Remember, engagement is interaction or collaboration or both. And collaboration is the next step in engagement, if you like. It's the deeper level, as I mentioned. We're still talking about your preparation before the meeting. If you want a discussion, if you want to get people talking to you, breakout rooms are a great way to do that, particularly if you're meeting as a larger meeting where uh, you know some people have already commented in the chat box, sometimes strong personalities can dominate. That's absolutely true. And if you want to minimize that, put people into smaller groups that's easier for them to find their voice. Um, so yeah, I mean, as long as <laughs> it's a very large meeting, if you have more than 200 people, <laughs> it's probably turning into a webinar. But you can use breakout rooms very effectively. You don't need to be skilled, very skilled at the platform. You just need to be familiar with the one that you're using. So you can use them with less than 200 people and they really can help build collaboration. Uh, and it just allows for more involvement, more creativity. You may not want to do a breakout room if it's a small meeting. Yeah, I don't know. You would use your judgment, but say five people. Is there really any point in having a breakout room? So there is an alternative to a breakout room. And the breakout room uh, alternative is paired chats. And paired chats can be really useful, particularly if you have a smaller meeting but you know that people may be reluctant to speak up for whatever reason, or you're just not getting people talking, then you can get them to send private chats to one individual. You pair them up and say, you know, you make a point and you say, I really like people's views on that. So in your pairs, talk to each other through the chat box. Of course, they're not using their voice, but they're typing to each other and that's them talking. They're really good in smaller meetings and for say briefer activities. Yeah, there's a watch out. If you've got global teams and English is not their first language, then you know they may have to be doing some translating, which might take a little bit of time. But you know, if you're over that, it's a really useful little tool. And of course, do remember, if you put people into pairs to talk about something to discuss in pairs, when they come back into the main meeting, then ask for a debrief. Say, OK, what did you talk about? What did you think about the point that I've just made? It's another way of getting people collaborating and talking to them to each other. And of course, when you bring the whole group back together, you need to get them sharing that so they're all talking with you and with the wider meeting too. So in terms of tools of engagement, it's about the techniques you pre-prepare to use in your planning, the techniques for collaboration you prepare to use when you're planning. But it's also about a few other things as well. And I would say when planning virtual meetings, there are a few other things that I think it's useful to remember. Do manage your own expectation as to how long it will take you to plan your virtual meeting. It's with no apology and no surprise that I'm nearly 20 minutes into this webinar and I'm still talking about planning virtual meetings. We're not even into the meeting itself yet. And you can expect it will take you longer because you're not just thinking of your content, you're actually planning which engagement tools to use and when. And you're going to have to make notes to yourself to do that. You should plan 
and I referred to this a few moments ago, you should plan to have your meeting attendees do something every three to five minutes. And I know that sounds a lot. I know it sounds a lot, but it is really effective. Why? Because we know that adult learning attention span is nine minutes average, which means for some it's much less than that. But also because we know, and you should know too, you must re you, you're going to lose people. You're going to lose people during your virtual meetings. They will become distracted. Some of your attendees might be eating their lunch. They might be folding laundry. <laughs> they might be looking at other things on their desk um, that surrounds their laptop. All you can do is plan to minimize their distractions. And you plan to minimize their distractions by having the tools that I've just been talking about and some other things as well that I'm going to go on to so that you bring them back to you at least every three to five minutes by getting them to do something. Um, I do live in the real world and I know that this is not always possible, but as far as possible, if you have real content heavy presentations, even though you can build in the interactive tools I've just been talking about, with content heavy presentations, I would say try and keep them to 45 minutes. And I would absolutely say the maximum length for any of your virtual meetings shouldn't be any more than two hours, and that includes a break. Halfway through, give them a break of 10 or 15 minutes. So also when you're planning, <laughs> there's a lot about planning, do remember the point that I've already made. If it's mainly a one-way presentation, you can and should still plan and design your meeting to have some interaction. So let me just um, recap on a couple of these and perhaps add one or two new ones too. So you're designing a meeting, you're going to give a lot of information and maybe you want, you certainly want interaction. Maybe you want people to collaborate and discuss on the points that you're making as well. Well, what you could do while you're planning your meeting is think you know what your content is. So perhaps at the very beginning of the meeting, you could give your attendees a multi-choice quiz and tell them during the course of this presentation, you're going to be hearing answers to, the fall to these questions. They then have something to do while that you're talking. They have an incentive to listen because they're listening for the answers to the questions that you have posed. It could work. You could also perhaps, I've mentioned pairing them up in the chat, you could pair them up from the very beginning of your meeting and at various times in your meeting, you will have planned to pause and say, okay, now have a private chat with the person I've paired you up with and talk about what are the main points that I've raised so far that you have found interesting or whatever it is, depending on what your meeting is about. So get them to discuss it in pairs throughout the session or, or maybe even just put them in pairs and say, will you now share your reflections with each other on what we've been talking about? Again, it's a way to get them talking to you throughout your content heavy presentation. You could maybe midpoint during the meeting, um, again, in pairs, get them to discuss one thing they've learned. You know, you could do pairs in breakout rooms, of course you can, or you can do them in a uh, private chat in the chat box, but get them talking, particularly if you think that there will be people in the meeting who may struggle to understand all the points that you're making. I don't know, you know, you're a finance manager and you're presenting some finance principles to people who are not normally finance um, minded. Get them in pairs to talk about um, one thing I've learned in the last 15 minutes and one thing I still don't understand. 
it help, it's easier to work in pairs and to make comments than it is to a large meeting, particularly if it's about something you're not sure about and you don't want to embarrass yourself by saying you don't understand. So one final tip that you could actually build into your meeting preparation is even if it's content heavy, instead of just slides, use video. Have more than one person talking, you know, have two presenters. Um, and of course, use all of the tools that I have just been talking about in terms of emoticons and chat box, etc. As I'm talking about planning a meeting, I, I can't not make a comment on slides, on PowerPoint slides. I can't not do it. And I think, you know, we've all been into endless meetings where it's just one slide after another, after another, after another, and people just talking, talking, talking. And, and again, we live in the real world and I know that happens. But remember in a virtual meeting, your slides are the online equivalent of eye contact and body language. And what I mean by that is that you can actually use your slides to see whether people are paying attention, not just for sharing content. So yes, you'll have content on your slides, you have to, but you can also write questions on them. You could turn bullet points, facts into a quiz. You could have your content on your slides and then get people to draw on the slide using the highlighter tool, which is one of the drawing tools in the whiteboard. You could get them to highlight the point that they think is most important. You've just got to think about different ways when you are planning your meeting to get people interacting and talking to you. Talking to you is not just about voice. It's about talking to you through the tools as well. And of course, slides are so important because each time you get an, you change slides, you get an opportunity to re-engage. Normal best practice for slides, you know this, is don't try not to put loads of content on them. And if you do have loads of content on them, don't then just read from them. And don't, a big do not, in my opinion, is say, you can read as well as I can. I'll give you a few minutes to read that. Uh, that's not a presentation. That's a document in slide format. And last but not least, I would strongly suggest don't slide, send out your slides before the meeting. Because if you do, what's the incentive for people to turn up? Now, you know, there may be times when you want people's comments, of course, or you want them to be prepared to discuss something. I, I know that. But if you want interaction, I would suggest don't send your slides out beforehand unless it's absolutely necessary. And I think a final point on your slides is remember that apart from your voice, in a virtual meeting, your slides are what people are focusing on most, more than anything else apart from your voice. So use them, use them in a way that gets them talking to you and not just to show information. A few more thoughts on planning and I promise we're gonna move into the what you need to do during the meeting. But I think this is a very important thought. You when you're planning, you can consider whether you would benefit from having two people manage the meeting, because essentially there are two roles in a, in a virtual meeting, much more than there is in most face-to-faces. There are two roles. The first is you, the presenter. You might be a team leader, you might be the subject matter expert, but you're probably the person responsible for the content and for achieving the meeting purpose. And that's one role. The second role is what I've called here the meeting host. It's the person who might help people if they've got technical problems. Um, the person who's monitoring the chat box, um, setting up 
breakouts if you're going to have breakouts. And depending on the number of meeting attendees you've got, it might be difficult for one person to do both of these roles well. And of course you can, you can. As one person, you can do both of these. But if there's a lot of people in the meeting, you are testing yourself to manage both of those. So while you're planning your meeting, think, is there somebody else I can ask to sit alongside of me and help me manage this meeting, allowing you to focus on the content and the interaction and getting people talking and the other person to focus on the more technical side of things, if you like. Doesn't need to be two of you, but if your meeting warrants it, having two of you can just take the heat off you a little bit. So to summarize, pre-meeting, when you are planning your meeting, I think there are three main areas of preparation. There's yourself, getting yourself ready. And that's about learning the platform. You don't need to be an expert on it, but you need to be as comfortable with it as you can be. Getting yourself ready means planning the meeting in terms of all the ways I have just been talking about so far. It's about getting participants ready, explaining the tools so that people can interact with one another. You'll know because you've planned it, you'll know which tools you want them to use and when. Don't assume that they know how to use them. So tell them, explain how to use it. And be aware in terms of getting participants ready. Some people may naturally want to log on from different devices, some from their PCs, some from the laptops, tablets, phones, etc. Um, when you're planning the meeting and you send an email out to set the meeting up, tell people what technology to use because then you've got everybody on a level playing field and you'll know if technical problems occur, you have a better chance of managing them. Third area, I believe, is technology and logistics. So while you're planning your meeting, check in early. Check time zones if it's a global meeting. Use time and world clock. Dot com. At the start of your meeting, most platforms have this feature. If you go into session and options, you can turn on attention tracking, and that allows you to know when a, um, a meeting attendee is not looking at the same screen as you, because it puts an exclamation mark or something similar to next to their name. And last but not least, when you are planning your meeting, have a backup plan, because things <laughs> Things will go wrong, and I'm going to come back to that again in a moment. So, planning the meeting, I cannot over, -es over emphasize how important that is. But let's have a look at uh, during the meeting now. And I think there are several things I'd like to talk about during the meeting to get people talking. Uh, the how you open the meeting is really important. Uh, what, what do people tend to remember most? Well, you'll have your own opinion on that. But in my view, I would say it's probably how the meeting starts and how it ends. Of course, people will remember the content, but the impact of the meeting is in the start and the end. So if you want a meeting that gets people talking, then get them talking as soon as you possibly can. Uh, for example, if they don't know each other, um, think about how can you manage their introductions in an interesting way. Uh, and I've got some thoughts to share with you on that. How do you get them into the right mindset for the meeting? How do you get them wanting to talk to each other to break the ice, if you like? Throughout the meeting itself, um, revisit points made by getting attendees to summarize. So instead of you summarizing, just take a backward seat and say, uh, Liz, could you do the summary of the meeting so far? John, will you do it next time, etc. Remember, when you call upon people by name, even if they have been distracted in the last couple of minutes, the sound of their name brings them right back 
to the meeting. Throughout the meeting, of course, use the tools for interaction, the tools for collaboration that I've talked about and plan the meeting with those in mind. And last point, I think it's a really important point. Throughout the meeting, do keep a note of who has spoken and how often. A very simple note by the side of your screen. Um, because when you're in the meeting, it's really easy to lose track of that. And yet it's vital so that you know you can call upon people if they're not contributing as much as, uh, as, much as you would want them to. So I mentioned some examples of how you can get people involved from the very start. And, and you know, there are many others, but these are just a couple of examples for you that you might find useful. Um, have a whiteboard, prepare it with some boxes on each one for, for your, the, the same number of participants that you have in the meeting. Get them to use the pointer to claim a box. The pointer will show what their name is. And then if they don't know each other, they could introduce themselves through typing into that box. If they do know each other and there's no need for introductions, then, you know, get them to put a comment in there. What have they done today? What did they see, say, see on TV last night? Um, what's the weather like in whatever city, country they're in at the moment? Whatever it may be. Now, the point of this is, is not, um, it's not to look clever. The point of this is you're starting the meeting, you want them involved from the very beginning because the sooner you get them involved, the easier it will be for them then to continue talking to each other. And of course, while they're typing on the whiteboard here, you could then, depending on how many people you have in the, the meeting, you could then say, um, uh, Liz, uh, I see you've, you, know, you've said this, tell us a little bit more about that. So you're getting people to hear the sound of their own voice from very early in the meeting. Another alternative, one that you often see in meetings because it's very effective, uh, if it's a global meeting, have a world map. Get people to asterisk where in the world they are. Of course, you can do this if it's all in one country or if it's in a certain part of the world, you just <laughs> enlarge um, the, the country to fill the, to fill the slide. Uh, again, why are we doing this? It's to get them to say hello, to get that socialization, to reduce the social distance that is implied in a virtual meeting. And you're not restricted by any two meter rule here. So get them to think of ways you can reduce the social distance to ease people into the meeting, to increase your chance of getting them talking. So, You've said hello, you've got people chatting with each other, you're starting to reduce the virtual distance, the social distance that they're feeling. And you're now into your meeting proper. You are, of course, going to present your agenda for the meeting. You would do this in most face-to-face -face meetings. You should certainly do it in all, in all virtual meetings. The why and what you meet, the purpose of the meeting, obviously. You know, because you've planned it, which tools you want them to use. So take the time, don't assume, take the time to explain to them how those tools are used. Of course, if it's a meeting you have with the same people regularly, you'll know they know them. But the point is made, don't assume. You're then going to go into your meeting content itself, of course, and you're going to end the meeting with the evaluation. and. I would suggest that you have something like that at the beginning of all of your virtual meetings because people want to know where they're going. So tell them. You know, we all have an unconscious um, need for certainty and security. These are unconscious emotional triggers that you may not be aware of them because they're in your unconscious but you, we have a need for certainty and security and we're not getting it into because of the situation, the global situation at the moment. Our sense of certainty, certainty and security is under attack. So in this tiny little way, 
you can help people feel more certain and secure in your meeting simply by outlining what the plan for the meeting is. At an unconscious level, it makes us feel better and more receptive. And the other thing that you can do to give people a sense of certainty in your meeting is introduce some ground rules. Now you've got some examples of ground rules there. You can, of course, have your own. You can suggest them. You could collaborate with people on them. But whatever ground rules you come up with, make sure they include rules for how you're going to communicate with each other as well. You know, we often talk about face-to-face -face meetings should have ground rules as best practice, but we often don't do it. I think it's very important for virtual meetings. And as you can see, a number of the ones on the slide there are about communication. Raise your hand if you have a, a, a question. Click on the hand icon, in other words. If you put a question in your chat box and there are a lot of people commenting in the chat, be patient, waiting for a response, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason that some of our ground rules are about communication is because during the meeting, it really is all about how you communicate. And a reminder of some of the basics, because they are the same in face-to-face -face meetings as they are in virtual. So in face-to-face -face meetings, you would greet people, you'd smile, you'd involve, you'd make small talk, etc. Do the same in your virtual meeting, because you know, it really does come through in your voice. If you smile when you're talking, it makes it easier, warmer for people to want to talk back. Just as you would in a face-to-face, -face, you ask somebody a question. You know, in a face-to-face -face meeting, you wouldn't give them two seconds and then jump in. You'd respect the silence. You'd give people time to think. Same in a virtual meeting. Though, of course, in a virtual meeting, a few seconds feels an awful lot longer. I know that. So there's some of the basics that are the same. But of course, there are big differences. And in a virtual meeting, you need to be conscious of all of the tools I've talked about and not just your content. Of course, your content is communication as well. Remember what I said earlier about your slides being an opportunity to re-engage with people, to involve them by asking them to write something on your slides. But it, it, it really is important that you don't just think slides, you think all the other tools and techniques I've talked about. And also, as I mentioned previously, what's different is, you know, you keep a record of who has contributed, who has spoken, who hasn't, because you then can use that to call upon people. If we're going to talk about communication, we have to talk about body language. And of course, that is much easier in a face to face, but it's not impossible in a virtual meeting. And the way you read people's body language in a virtual meeting is through the quantity and the quality of their responses to you. So look for things like, uh, you know, are they giving you full answers or are they just giving you one or two words if you ask a question? Look at, is there constantly an exclamation mark next to their name? Because if there is, then either they're writing notes about the meeting on another um, page um, or they are doing their emails or looking somewhere else. The exclamation mark, mark shows that they are looking at another site, um, but it may be note-taking. So ask them. So watch for their responses. Watch for the time it takes. Watch for people who always say, uh, sorry, Liz, didn't, didn't catch that. Can you repeat that? Well, that might be an audio problem, or it might be because they weren't listening until you mentioned their name. That's a body language issue. Um, you want people to feel comfortable answering any questions you may have. So when you're planning, anticipate, think, what questions might I get asked and how would you respond to them? For people whose um, first language is not the same as yours, 
if you have a question or you want them to do something, an instruction, then have it already typed out on a Word document and simply copy and paste it into the chat box because it might be easier for them to read it. So all sorts of tips for you as to how you can read body language through how they respond. And right in the middle of the slide there, you'll see webcam, I think is hugely helpful but it's not a measure of engagement any more than looking at you is when face to face. But of course, it does help. Don't assume just because your webcam on is on that you're interacting. You're not, but it's helpful. Now, I mentioned using your voice, um, basic communication skill, critical in a virtual meeting. So think long and hard about your intonation, your pace, your tone, etc. Think how do radio presenters engage you? Um, if possible, keep it. Now, I know they're trained, but you can emulate them. Terry Wogan um, often had an audience of millions, 8 million plus. And yet, whenever he was interviewed, he said he'd thought of his audience as one person at a time. He wasn't talking to 8 million. He was talking to the driver of the lorry delivering goods. He was talking to the parent delivering, taking their children to school. And he would often refer to them as dear listener, not listeners. It was very, very engaging way. Of course, he was a professional. Use your voice, it really does come through if you smile and you use hand gestures. Some people are nervous about having a webcam on because of the hand gestures. Don't be, don't be. It's very human to see it. Say exactly what you mean. Use a very specific language. And what I mean by that is, you know, try to uh, minimize the amount of times in your virtual meetings where you might say, does anybody have a question? Because it's almost guaranteed to lead to silence. You can simply tweak that by saying, does anyone have a question? Click on the hand icon if you do. Give me a red cross if you don't. You know they're there and they're listening because you can monitor their responses. And of course, do remember, <laughs> it's not just your voice in the meeting. Um, so get other people, allow them to talk always start with them in a way that I have talked about getting them talking from the very beginning and finish with uh, finish the meeting with them talking in a way I'll um, explain what I mean by that in a moment. So what if you do do all of that and you still have some problems? You know, you have virtual attendees who talk too much or virtual attendees who don't talk at all. <laughs> well, plan to have those. Uh, by use and minimize it by using the tools that we have been talking about. What if you have people who, as I've said, always have an exclamation mark next to their name? Well, I've said it could be because they're making notes or it could be that they're doing their email. Ask them. Use their name to bring them in. The people who always say, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat that, please? Could be your audio. Could be they're not listening. You can ask them. You can say, in a moment, I'm going to ask a question. Liz, I'm going to address the question to you. You'll bring them back into it. You'll get them talking to you. And then, of course, you always have people who seem never to have a microphone that's working seem to log on and have to be on mute because of background noise, they're logging on from a public place, address those issues outside of the meeting, set out your expectations, maybe have it in the ground rules. So plan to have people who will create challenges for you and think about how you're going to overcome those in the way I've just mentioned. Checklist for during the meeting. Uh, I think I've mentioned most of these. Use your tool every few minutes. Call on people directly. Um, get people talking to each other. So, you know, you can say, um, uh, Michael, what do you think of what Sophia has just said? 
give clear instructions. Try not to draw too much attention to the fact that this is virtual technology. So if somebody, say, does click on the hand icon and wants to ask you a question, it, it's really nice just to be able to say, yeah, go ahead with your question, Liz. You don't have to say, I see you've got your hand up. It's not vital, but it's another little, little touch that will make this virtual meeting um, seem more natural, encourage people to talk to you. Uh, I think the one thing I haven't mentioned so far is in virtual meetings, as in face-to-face, -face, it's no different. Start and end on time. I know that so far I've talked about mainly as if you are managing this meeting, you're setting it up, you're leading it. And I said at the very beginning that we were going to talk also about those meetings you go to where you are simply a participant. And I think this summarizes it. Um, yes, you have an active role to play. You've got to be open, present, active, involved. You've got to do the things that are assigned to you. You've got to be mindful of other people's languages and locations. In other words, do not be passive. That is your main role if you're a meeting attendee. And of course, of course, give feedback to the meeting owner on everything that we've talked about so far as part of the meeting evaluation. That really is all of our responsibilities. If virtual meetings are not working for us because we're not talking enough, we're not interacting enough, then give the feedback. It gives the other person an opportunity to do something about it. It's the minimum we can do, particularly when we're attending so many of them at the moment. And I'm going to come back to that question of evaluation, but before I do, um, let's have a look at some of the things that can go wrong. Now, I've mentioned in inverted commas, problem people, those who talk too much, don't talk enough, etc. But there are others, um, other things that can and will go wrong in a virtual meeting uh, and expect them. They get people talking about the meeting for sure, but not in the way that you want them to. So it's things like, you know, we've all been part of them. It's where audio has failed for one person, but not for everybody. It's where some people see your slides and others don't. It's where your slides freeze and you can't move them on. There are techniques and tips for overcoming all of those. Uh, you know, if, if your slides don't move on, the best I can share with you is clear your cache. Make sure it's completely cleared. It just seems to free it up. It's, it's, it's magic. <laughs> One thing I would say is as you are going through your virtual meetings and things go wrong, keep a repository of things that go wrong and how you overcame them because that, that knowledge sharing, for you, keeping it for yourself and sharing it with others is really, really helpful. The key thing here, though, is if you have a meeting with several people and one or two people have difficulties, do not spend the first 15 minutes of your meeting getting them, helping them. Um, this is where the benefit of having a second person helping you manage the meeting really kicks in. But don't do that because by the time you've helped them, you've lost everybody else. They've checked out mentally, if not physically. Get them to log out and come back in again or rearrange the meeting, but don't start the meeting with 15 or 20 minutes of, of managing audio disasters. And now moving on then to end this, uh, to start ending this webinar, but also talking about ending your meeting. Think of ACT when you're ending your meeting. It's simple, it's about you end it with action planning as you would every meeting. End it with some celebration, perhaps that's not the right, the best word, but a fix this acronym ACT, but celebrating by thanking people, of course, um, uh, and by commenting on the interaction that you've had, how great it's been, whatever it might be. And also think of you know, a social way that you can end the meeting so you're getting people chatting again. You'll end your meeting going back to your objectives. And the point that I want to make on this is it's not just did you achieve what you set out to achieve in terms of content, but did you get engagement? 
interaction, collaboration, because that was part of your objectives too. So tie those things back together. And you'll be able to do that through your evaluation. It really is important to evaluate your virtual meetings. What you want to evaluate depends on what your objectives were, of course. But I think the minimum you need to know is things like, was this meeting a good use of people's time? To what extent did people feel involved? Did you achieve your objectives, et cetera, et cetera. And in terms of finishing the meeting with them talking, think about having your evaluation as the very last thing they do in the meeting. Maybe you could run a poll. You're getting them talking to you. Or maybe you, if, if it's not a poll, um, just have the meet, you know, the evaluation as a list of questions on your final slide and people have got to respond to them through the chat box or on the slide. And if you don't do that as an absolute minimum, have the evaluation ready to send out as soon as the meeting is finished, because otherwise you might not get it back. But I strongly suggest if you can, end with it through getting them talking to you and you've got instant evaluation. So that's me done for now. I'm just going to pass back to see the few minutes that we have left if Rob has been able to pull any theme for questions. Uh, Rob? Hi Liz, thank you very much for, for that. Um, there wasn't a huge, huge amount of questions. I mean, they split into sort of two main categories. Uh, the first of the category was very much about um, delivery systems and tools. So quite specific rather than a, 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 a generic questions. And one of the questions was, was what would you recommend? Um, and the other one goes on about, you mentioned right at the start, I think putting blank white slides in um, mm -hmm. to act as whiteboards and how that would work. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's a more specific to, to individual packages rather than generic uh, mm -hmm. questions. Okay, great. Um, we may have our own favorite ones. And I know at the moment people are using Zoom an awful lot. Um, my favorites, I'm just going to tell you my favorites. And I think generally considered still best practice is Adobe Connect and WebEx. But they have so many similarities. But I'm, I'm very familiar with those two. And they are the ones that I know a lot of other people professionally use for their meetings. So Adobe Connect or WebEx would be my recommendations. Please don't tell all the other providers that I've said that, though, in case I'm crossed off their list. <laughs> um, and, and I like Zoom for social things, for keeping in contact with my family, for example, at the moment. How whiteboards use, experiment with it. Honestly, it simply is a white slide. And as long as your platform has drawing tools, and I don't know a platform that doesn't, certainly Adobe Connect and WebEx have, but as long as your meeting attendees can access drawing tools, text tools, um, for example, and highlighters, you can put a blank slide in there and get them typing. You can even draw on them. You know, you could have just some fun activities in your meeting um, if your meeting topic lended itself to that. But uh, yeah, does that answer the question, Rob? It's simply put a white slide in as long yeah. as there's drawing tools, start playing with them. Exactly, and I, and I think that's exactly the, the right answer. Um, the next sort of um, group of questions, should we say, was, was, was about, um, <clears throat> The fact you mentioned there's a lot of interaction to produce, get a lot of interaction within the meetings, but there wasn't much interaction with, with, within this presentation. I'm probably worth defining the difference between what we've presented here mm. uh, and different types of meetings where perhaps you, you have more of a formal um, lecture type presentation rather than the, the, the interaction. And actually, there, there are different types of meetings and, and how that would work. I think that's, yeah, absolutely. All great questions, these. Webinars tend to be one way, um, then because they tend to have very large audiences and you are presenting information. 
of course, if we had had some, um, if we'd expected fewer people, we could have had polls, etc. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, um, a webinar tends to be you presenting information to a group of people, a large group of people. The virtual meetings that we tend to run through work um, are team meetings, project meetings, etc. And those are the meetings where you can really put the time into having the level of interactivity. Webinars, webinars, for example, you'd never train by delivering a webinar. You'd never deliver a training session by a webinar because it's simply too much of a one-way device. Um, but any other virtual delivery, yes, you should have all of the things that I have talked about today in terms of the tools and techniques. Cool. And um, a couple other questions here. Um, regarding sharing slides beforehand, you, you mentioned that probably you would have advised not to. And the question is uh -huh. basically, would you, send, would you send an agenda? Yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with that. And I think the point that I made about people having this unconscious need for certainty and security, you know, we cannot overestimate a, an agenda will help with that. Nothing wrong with an agenda, but send your content out and you're sending, you're taking away, you're stealing your own thunder um, because they already know what you're going to present. They're already ready not to listen, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And uh, next one probably is, uh, how do you get the attendees to focus on the slides instead of the chat? Ah, <laughs> great question. Um, if you think there's a real, if you don't, you can plan and not include the chat box. So you could close the chat box down. Um, if you think that there is an, uh, there's going to be a risk of people paying more attention to the chat than to your slides. If there are two of you, you can get somebody to monitor the two of you running the meeting. You can get somebody to, ma to monitor and put up messages in the chat box as saying this chat box is too busy. Uh, you know, you'll find the right words to say that, but you can put messages out saying, can we have fewer chats, please? You can, on most platforms, um, organize your chat box so that messages are just sent to you. Uh, this depends on how you set up the meeting in the virtual platform. So you don't you could disable the feature that says send messages to everyone. So there are ways you can limit chat usage. Some of them means dealing with it directly. Um, yeah. Cool, okay, uh, what else have we got here? Um, how do you manage people who talk too much? <laughs> um, I think um, you, you plan that you're going to have people who talk too much for a start and in part of your planning you then if you have somebody who's talk you know you, you expect is going to talk too much have breakout rooms where okay they may talk too much in the breakout room but other breakout rooms are not hearing it so it's not affecting everybody you can plan to use paired chat so that person who talks too much is at that time only talking through type which might slow them up a little bit they're not talking um, audibly and they're only talking to one other person anyhow um, uh, yet redirect them so you know if Liz is talking too much you can say Liz can I interrupt really great points love to hear what anybody else thinks about them you know, so you may have to be very directive in that sense. So it's down to facilitation techniques, Rob, as well as breakout rooms, paired chat, etc. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, coming to the end, we're, we're slightly over time. Uh, just from a personal line, a key point of view, I'd just like to let everyone know Liz is, uh, this is Liz's last uh, webinar or anything, last active thing I think she's doing for right now. She's due to retire. <laughs> I'd just like to thank her very much from, from myself, my point of view, for all the help and support she's done, and from IMEC's point of view, for all the hard work, dedication she's given over the last number of years. And, and so thank you very much, uh, Liz. Uh, well, I didn't expect that, Rob. Um, <laughs> I'm smiling and embarrassed, but thank you. <laughs> 
And, and finally, thank you all for, for everyone for attending. Um, I hope it was very informative. I apologise we can't get through all the questions uh, that, that everyone asked, and hopefully I've, I've selected a few that cover the, the, the broad areas that you've asked for. Anyway. And again, thank you for your time and thank you for attending the webinar. Um, in the chat box, there is a, a, a link every now and then. I think uh, the guys have been putting in to, to access this uh, webinar and the previous webinars um, that we've done. Uh, this will be available in a couple of days' time once we've uploaded it. And again, thank you for your time. Thanks, Rob. And a very warm, a very warm goodbye from me. I started with a warm welcome, <laughs> a very warm goodbye, and good luck. Thanks, everyone.